Thank you, Ajita, and um, thank you, Sages, for the privilege of the podium. We're going to kind of get into the nuts and bolts about tips and tricks. Conrad hit on some of the things, um, and we'll try to get into a little bit more detail about it. So these are my disclosures. We're going to talk a little bit about patient selection and patient positioning. Most of you are all familiar with patient um, selection at this point, and spend most of the time talking about the tips and tricks um, of robotic tap and robotic re -stopa. The first being um, potential for indications. So as, as Dr. Ballister alluded to, not all of these are gonna be germane to a robotic approach. Obviously the patient on the left is not gonna get a robotic repair, but you have to decide where you're ultimately going to start. And so perhaps you start with the small incarcerated umbilical hernias as was shown previously and you grow your practice and you grow your offerings as you move forward and gain more experience. Um, and so the patient selection for robotics versus open ventral hernia repair really um, shouldn't be all that different. In other words, if the patient needs a transversus abdominis release, if you can do it robotically or open, then that should be consideration. It shouldn't simply be because you want to use a robot that you do a repair that you might not otherwise do in the patient. So I think that's a general, general guideline. The rest of the guidelines have been outlined and you can see them here, I won't go over all of them, but um, some of the things that make these robotic hernia repairs more difficult are shown here, particularly the multiple defects, the ones that Dr. Balliser just showed in the flank. Um, patients who've had previous mesh implantation or have non-compliant abdominal walls uh, because of the need for pneumoperitoneum. Uh, other factors that can increase the complexity of these repairs are the location. So he showed you some subxiphoid and subcostal, so we won't necessarily reiterate that. Um, or thin peritoneum, which means that you have to have more than one thing in your armamentarium. So I think Conrad would be the first to say there are times when a robotic tap repair is the preferred approach, and for whatever reason, it's not possible due to, due to patient conditions, and so you have to have some backup plan. Um, trocar positioning uh, for Midline, for instance, um, ventral and or incisional hernias is demonstrated here. Now, in reality, trocars are placed more lateral than what you see in this picture. So it's much more along the anterior axillary line or sometimes even more lateral in larger defects uh, compared to moving more medial. And that can vary a little bit by which robot you happen to be using, whether you're using an SI or XI as far as the patient um, trocar distances are, are concerned. Um, like was shown previously, you dock from one side or the other, or depending on your robotic platform, sometimes you have to spin the patient and dock from both sides. Um, if you use an XI, for instance, you don't ever have to move the patient. You can simply move the booms of the equipment. As far as the equipment itself, I use uh, three robotic instruments, and I think uh, um, my colleague TJ Swope would say, before you start trying to limit the number of instruments you utilize, get good at the operation first. Um, and then get faster at it, and then ultimately get cheaper at it. So what I tend to use is a pair of monopolar scissors. Uh, for very large defects, I'll use a vessel sealer, and I can explain why offline, but a grasper is certainly uh, viable, and then a needle driver, and literally there's usually only one instrument exchange for the entire operation. Uh, we won't belabor the point of IPOM because there's multiple different ways to secure mesh to the anterior abdominal wall, and, and pretty much all of you are familiar with it already. Um, so whether you suture it or suture it and tack it um, is, is dependent on your practice pattern and your experience. So I'll spend more time talking about a robotic tap and robotic reef stopa repair from a technique standpoint. So again, for trocar placement, as I showed in the earlier illustration, the idea is to put them relatively or as far lateral as you can based on the defect size. The larger the defect, the more lateral the trocars. If you use an uh, SI platform, you have to try to keep those trocars roughly about eight centimeters apart so that you avoid the arm collisions that Sharon and others have discussed previously. With the XI, you have a little bit more pliability. You can put the trocars a little closer, stagger them a little bit more, and, and, and the arms, due to the patient clearance option in the robotic platform, allow you to, to put trocars in positions that are otherwise a little bit more difficult with the SI. So that's something to consider. Um, and, and again, patient clearance, meaning uh, making sure that the arms are free of the patient is an important thing as well. Um, then obviously dissection is the next step. So you perform your adhesiolysis, you're all ready to go. And then you're gonna incise the peritoneum on the ipsilateral side of the trocars. I'm gonna show you that in a video. Um, trying to minimize 
peritoneal wrens, which ultimately need to be repaired, um, and then trying to reduce the sac in mass if possible, or at least um, plicate it in your diastasis repair and your hernia repair. As far as defect closure itself, um, one of the key components of any of these robotic ventral hernia repairs is to ensure that you have anterior rectus sheath and or linea alba. If you have linea alba available to you, uh, you don't want to simply close the posterior sheath or stitch only into the muscle. You'll know that because the sutures will pull out um, and obviously you're not closing the defect. Um, depending on what type of suture you use, um, some are self-locking, some choose to just use monofilament suture. Uh, obviously the stitching technique is different depending on which type of suture you use, but if you do use self-locking stitches, particularly on larger defects, I find when you first start doing these, it's a little bit easier to pull the sutures through each and every time and tighten them as you go. And as you gain more experience or you become more comfortable um, suturing robotically upside down on the anterior abdominal wall, if you choose to throw multiple throws and then pull it through, that's perfectly acceptable as well. As far as mesh size, I think one of the benefits of the, the TAP and the TAR approach is the fact that you can gain significant mesh overlap and use much larger pieces of mesh than you might otherwise use and are often easier to manipulate than IPOM or barrier coated synthetic meshes for standard laparoscopic IPOM repairs. Um, we've seen lots of different ways to secure the mesh and we can argue about that all day, but again, I would reiterate the point of minimal fixation or, or adequate fixation as necessary to alleviate tension on the midline. Um, excessive fixation is something I've gotten away from and I think others have, have explained to you today that they may have gotten away from as well. And then peritoneal closure, and re realistically oftentimes that's the most difficult portion of the procedure because of the fact that the peritoneal flap has to be made in a location where you can get both of your arms to the point and so the entire peritoneum very close to the camera. And I'll highlight that here um, in this video. Let's see if we can start it because I don't see the mouse. There we go. So... Um, Here's an example of a quick um, explant of a, of a patch that had been placed for umbilical hernia repair. This is not a big defect. It's pretty standard for a robotic tap ventral. And just as Conrad showed in his previous um, videos, it's the dissection of the peritoneum. One of the things that I do, one of the tips and tricks that I do for this component is to decide where the defect is with regard to size, how big my mesh is ultimately going to be, and I know I want to put that mesh down the middle of the defect, and therefore try to start my peritoneal flap with enough room on the ipsilateral side to assure that the mesh is not off center so that you don't have 10 centimeters on one side and four centimeters on the other side of the defect. So that's one thing to guard against. The second way you can try to ensure yourself that you're gonna be able to close that peritoneal flap when you get done with the operation is to do what I call ranging the instruments. So put your camera in, make a couple of small little peritoneal burns on where you think you'd like to make the peritoneal cut and ensure that your instruments can get there, cephalad and caudad, moving the robot before you even incise the peritoneum to know you can get the, uh, the equipment there to close the peritoneal flap when the time comes. Then just like Conrad showed before, there's circumferential dissection. You can utilize instrumentation to generally measure your defect. You can use rulers and, and, and hopefully coming soon there'll be a way to measure that right from the console um, using computer-assisted technology. As, as Conrad showed, closure of the defect, again, key points here are to ensure that you're grabbing the anterior rectus sheath um, and not simply the posterior rectus sheath. You can excise the hernia sac, as was done in this case. You can plicate the hernia sac, as was shown in Conrad's videos. Um, the data uh, are not strong one way or the other, saying that you have to do it one way or the other. So it sort of depends on your personal experience and your personal outcomes. Um, if we can jump a little bit ahead in this video, let's see, maybe it'll let me. There we go, perfect, thank you. So as you, as you close this defect, um, key points with utilizing the self-locking sutures is to go back over. Um, I even throw a little loop or, uh, or secure it to itself as you close these defects. Now let's see, can I have the mouse back again? There we go. Hmm. Or not. So if we can jump ahead maybe 
a minute in this video or so about, yeah, about there is good. Or not. That's all right. Um, so I'll, I'll just take it. I'll take it. It's fine. Um, I'll show you actually in the next video because it's, it's a bit shorter the, about the mesh placement. Um, if we can start this video. So again, um, just to reiterate some of the key points is sizing your defect to assure appropriate midline um, mesh placement, um, ranging your instrumentation so that you know that your peritoneal flap will get closed, and that's kind of what I'm demonstrating here in this component of the video as far as a tip or, or, or technique, um, because I've, I've gained that experience by not having an appropriately sized piece of peritoneum, and then you're, you're left with uncoated polypropylene mesh or uncoated mesh in your pre-peritoneal space that you can't adequately cover with peritoneum, even with, with a desufflated abdomen or a minimally insufflated abdomen, and then you're left with potentially needing to cover that mesh with something else or doing some other strategies to, to cover that mesh or even changing the mesh and, and, and wasting money associated with utilizing a mesh that you have to get rid of. Um, so those are key points there. The second thing is the peritoneum, as shown here, can be very, very thin. Um, so whatever grasper you use, keep in mind that um, pulling down on that peritoneum, as opposed to pulling it toward the trocar, uh, can significantly create tension and tear that or rend that peritoneum. So I often try to get the fellow or myself to pull the peritoneum toward the trocar itself, as opposed to toward the viscera. I think that creates a little bit less likelihood that the peritoneum will tear and then you can create these large peritoneal flaps for relatively small defects to get significant mesh overlap. Um, again, as Dr. Chen highlighted earlier uh, in the program this morning, I try to use um, minimal fixation. So if we can jump ahead in this video, that would be great, and I'll show fixation of that mesh. If you can move the video ahead or give it to me. Oh, now I can do it, excellent. Um, so closure of the peritoneal defects or, or, or hernia sac is a key component. This is true whether you're doing a robotic tar or whether you're doing a pre-peritoneal repair because we want to try to avoid or at least minimize the risk for sort of a pre-peritoneal or intraparietal hernia. So I think that's an important component. Um, closure of the defect, uh, we've seen. This is also including closure or plication of the diastasis. As Conrad alluded to, I do that as well to try to minimize the risk for hernia recurrence. Um, you can measure your pre-peritoneal space, and you can see I started with what was essentially about a four by four or four by three centimeter defect. I'm gonna have significant mesh overlap. Uh, you can do this with um, self-gripping meshes as is shown here. You can do this with medium weight or heavyweight polypropylene mesh secured with fibrin sealant, um, which is how I do the majority of my hernia repairs. So there are various strategies to do that. And then ultimately it's closure of the peritoneum. And as shown, this can be very tricky because you're sewing very close to the, uh, to the mesh and the camera. So it's important to try to ensure you've got adequate peritoneal overlap. Um, and then last is sort of the robotic restopa. Again, these are lateral placement of trocars, appropriate patient positioning and padding. The hardest part of this is to identify the space one or the location one to two centimeters media to the linea semilunaris. You don't want to cut the posterior sheath lateral to the semilunaris for obvious reasons. You're not in the right place. That's not the right place to start. So the idea is to start where you see rectus abdominis muscle. That can be one of the most tricky parts. It also means that you have to have the camera and the equipment far enough lateral that you'll also be able to close that posterior rectus sheath at the completion of the operation. So again, I, I, I consider ranging the instruments to ensure that you're in the right spot. The second, uh, the second difficult component of the procedure is crossing the midline and making sure that you're in the right space as you do this. Um, one of the caveats is that you wanna sort of work ventrally, and as you work ventrally, one error you can make is go through the linea alba itself, um, if in fact the linea alba is present, which you wanna try to avoid. The second is to get in the wrong plane on the contralateral side. So you tend to get in the pre-peritoneal space by accident, because you haven't incised the posterior rectus sheath on the contralateral side. 
So you need to ensure you can do that. Again, visualizing rectus abdominis muscle to ensure that you're in the, in the retrorectus plane and then continue your dissection as you move laterally. So here's the defect, we'll kind of jump ahead. Um, you can dissect that clear out to the lineus semilunaris as shown here on the contralateral side. You can complete, um, completely measure your defect. Um, we do this for obviously data acquisition purposes as well as mesh sizing. Once that's done, we include um, closure of the defect and plication. You've seen these things before, so we won't belabor this point. Um, and now you can truly get a good sense of, of what will fit in your retrorectus space. Now the majority of the time, I don't use self-gripping mesh, I simply use uh, polypropylene. You can secure that polypropylene with sutures if you like, or with fibrin sealant alone, which works quite well. You can choose to place a drain or not in the retrorectus repairs such as this. I don't routinely place drains. Uh, I don't do it open either, so I, I try to do it the same way each time. And then finally, closure of the peritoneum. Sometimes this takes a little bit of left-handed sewing, uh, especially if you didn't get your instruments in the right place, which is demonstrated here. So that's an important thing to note. That robotic arm is inside the peritoneal cut to ensure I had enough overlap. So it does get a little bit tricky. Um, it is possible, but that's why I reiterate the importance of ranging your instrumentation. Uh, we inspect the peritoneum at the end to ensure that everything is covered um, and that there are no peritoneal holes. So that's, um, that's the techniques and tips I think are key to when you're addressing these uh, from an anatomical standpoint as well as from a technical standpoint. So thank you very much. Thank you.